Extraordinary is the podcast from the BBC World Service, bringing you extraordinary personal stories from around the globe. Search for Lives Less Ordinary wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Welcome to the documentary from the BBC World Service. I'm Hadija Tusise, a reporter with Africa Eye, and in this edition of Assignment, I'm in the Central African country of Gabon to investigate a dark secret in football. You may find some of the details in this program disturbing. Good evening, my friend. I said I would call you back. So here is a clear and precise message. I've been handed this audio message from a man who's too frightened to meet, but who wants to tell his story. We were at a football training camp for five days and on the fourth night, they came for me. We were in the dorm, lying in our bunk beds and in the middle of the night, they came. They would go into the rooms and... <sighs> Sorry, it still affects me. It's a secret, secret kind of thing. So if you want to keep playing, you have to keep the secret. It's Saturday morning football training on a field in the suburbs of Gabon's capital, Libreville. The coach is former international player, Parfendong. He sorts the younger boys, aged from 3 to 10, into groups. Defenders and attackers. There's a star quality about Parfait. The kids hang on his every word. Football is almost a religion here in Gabon. More than 80% of the country is rainforest. It's called the last Eden. But a third of the population lives below the poverty line. So football is seen as a way to get a better life. Le football représente dans notre pays. In Gabon, it's every boy's dream to become a football player. It's not just about money. Their dream is to play for a European club, to get out of Gabon. Their first goal is to get out of Gabon. It was the same for Parfait. When he was 15, he got his first break. I grew up in a village, in a very poor family, but I always had this passion, this love for football. And I had the desire to prove to people you can make it, no matter what your life circumstances are. This is a clip of Parfait Long at the height of his career. Now the counter-attack, Gabon. He's playing for Gabon in the Africa Cup of Nations. Endon. He then went on to play in the National League in Portugal. Not well enough, who's in the middle? No, the final ball not good enough. And back at that Nigerian... After an injury ended his professional playing career, he turned to coaching in Switzerland. Four years ago, he came home. I wanted to go back to Gabon because I was feeling useless. I felt like what I was teaching to these little Europeans, I could be teaching to kids back home. But on his return, he says he started seeing and hearing disturbing things. There were things I was seeing, gestures, not to mention what I heard being said on the sidelines. As a coach, you're not supposed to be hanging out with kids after hours. You shouldn't be driving other people's kids around. Parfait was suspicious. He would have his fears confirmed. What was happening was the sexual abuse of young players by senior coaches. We spoke to more than 30 people who had testimony about child sex abuse in Gabonese football. They told us about a culture of abuse. It's late at night. I've come to a neighborhood on the outskirts of the capital, Libreville, where the narrow, windy streets feel like a maze. 
I'm here to meet a man I'm going to call Alain and his mother. They've agreed to talk as long as we don't reveal their identity. So their words are spoken by an actor. We were grouped together, eight of us. One of the coaches said, you want to be famous, to travel, don't you? He was laughing. He said, it's every footballer's dream. But what are you going to give us in return? Alain was 17 at the time. He's now in his early 30s. He had just been selected to play for Gabon's Junior National League. He was thrilled. His dream to become a professional player seemed now within reach. At first, Alain thought the coach was talking about money. He said, no, it's not that. There are things you have to do. They laughed. They said, we're going to the office. We'll explain more. I was puzzled. Going to the office? To do what? The coach told him, give us your bottom. My son said, what? I can't do things like that. He says he refused. Shortly after, Alain's mother says he was punished. They were lining up in the field. Then the coach called my son's name and tore up his license to play. He soon stopped playing altogether. If my son could have progressed in football, it could have helped me. It hurts. Alan's mother touches my hand as she speaks. Her eyes are downcast, and she seems to be holding back tears. There's only so much of their story they're willing to share. It's just the two of us talking now, isn't it? But if someone were to overhear, let's say there's this woman, and she's saying things that send someone to silence me. So I tell myself, what's done is done. I'll keep my mouth shut. We keep coming across this fear. Here in Gabon, it was only Alain and his mother who agreed to meet me and be recorded. I've spent the entire day speaking with men who were sexually abused when they were kids by coaches and many of them are not willing to testify. They are absolutely terrified and this only breaks my heart because it shows just how much grip the perpetrators still have on their victims to this day. People who are out of the country feel freer to talk, but they still don't want to be identified. I'm on a video call with a former international Gabonese player who is now living in Europe. I'm going to call him Julien. When I think about these things, I punch the wall because you always ask yourself why. You ask yourself the question, why? and you don't feel comfortable, you don't feel good. In all our interviews, one name keeps coming up. Capello, the nickname for coach Patrick Asumuei. Julien says he heard about Capello long before he met him. The first time I heard about him, I must have been about six or seven years old. We were told there is this guy Capello. He coaches the junior national teams. He's a good coach a funny coach, but he also does these things. He was 11 the first time he saw Capello at a match in the capital. I remember, as soon as he appeared, everybody started applauding and chanting his name. It was the whole stadium. I saw him arrive. He was talky, with his feet arched and his belly sticking out. He didn't even smile. He was cold. He walked right past where Julien was sitting. I was scared. I had goosebumps. I say to myself, I hope he doesn't look at me. Two years later, their paths crossed. On the day we met for the first time, I realized he already knew who I was. He doesn't miss a single player. He knows everyone by name, who's playing where, and especially if the boy is a strong player. He find out who he is, where he's from. Even the most remote places in Gabon, he'll find out. We don't know how he does it. 
and Julien was a good player. Capello wanted him to play in the regional league. I was happy, but I was also scared. He picks the best players in Gabon, so I was proud to think I was at the top. But I also had this fear about what was going to happen to me. When he was 12, he says the harassment began. He was in the changing rooms after a training session when the stadium caretaker came in. He said, your coach told me to lock up. You're going to have a shower in the athletics truck. There were hose pipes laid out. And we thought, well, that's fine. This must be what the other athletes do when they finish. They must wash like this, so no problem. As he and his friend were showering, he noticed Capello spying on them. I saw Capello peering at us, and when he saw we were looking at him, he ducked back, and at the same time, he'd had his hands down his trousers. And then, when he was 14, he says Capello abused him. One day, I don't know how it happened. The two of us ended up on the street at night. He was pressuring me, telling me he liked me and he was interested. He touched my genitals. I felt powerless. I just stood there and he started to lower himself. I never told anyone about this. It hits you hard. It hits you in the gut. You feel like throwing up. And at first, you do not know how to deal with it. He'd call me a man of little faith because I didn't want things to happen with him. He'd always say, don't you want the presence of mind to succeed in football? You'll never make it otherwise. This term, presence of mind, is something I keep hearing. Buffet says it was an expression Capello used. Capello had a sort of fetish phrase presence of mind. You want to play on the national team? You want to make the selection? Then I have to pass on to you the presence of mind. And to get this so-called presence of mind, you had to submit to being abused by Capello. When a boy of 16 or 17 years old gets told about this presence of mind, he sees his future as the next Ronaldo. It's dangled in front of him. He can't refuse. Presence of mind is such a strong word. For a child, it's like a Christmas present. The man who sent me the message, the one we heard at the start, describes Capello as a technical coach on the pitch and a monster of it. I say he's a monster because he destroyed lives destroyed futures, destroyed young people, children, and even adults, not just children. He says Capello and his men would come into the dorms at night. A warning, this is very disturbing to hear. I saw my brothers get up and go with them because they had no choice. The men would tell them to. And then the next day, my friends were passing blood in the toilets and showers. You could see the blood coming out of their buttocks. They couldn't play anymore. They couldn't run anymore. I wondered what was happening to them, but nobody wanted to answer me. One night, they came for him and his best friend. They started touching me, touching my brother, and I couldn't understand. I wanted to scream. I wanted to get out but the door was closed and they threw me to the floor. There were two strong security men in that room and it was as if they were prepared for this. He was forced to watch his friend being raped. He gave me a look as if to say, let's just go along with them and get it over with. I looked him in the eye and started praying. I tried to fight them off, and the men forced me to masturbate them and to give them oral sex. Because he fought back, he says he was punished. They told me I would never be in the selection again, ever again. And if I dared to speak out, me and my family would be dealt with. I never played again.
Au Gabon, l'affaire Coach Capello réveille d'énormes secrets dans le monde du football. En décembre 2021, Capello was arrested along with two other coaches. They have denied the allegations made against them. But Capello has admitted to raping, grooming and exploiting young players. The question now is who knew what and when? And why did they not stop it? This is Julien again, the player who left Gabon and is now living in Europe. To talk about skill, I don't know how many coaches are abusing boys. But for one moment, let's look at Capello. He's the most well-known. He's been doing this for the last 25 or 30 years. Every year, he had access to at least 50 boys, if not more. It's the late afternoon. Parfait, the coach, takes me to the Omnisport Stadium. It's one of the biggest in Gabon and where a lot of the abuse is said to have happened. I don't understand how the president of the Federation and the leaders of Gabonese football could have been aware of this and not have done anything. Because Parfait claims they were aware. He had raised the alarm. Eleven months before Capello was arrested, Parfait says he went directly to see the president of the Football Federation, warning him about his suspicions of abuse by Capello and other coaches. I had to denounce it. I couldn't keep quiet about it. I have children of my own and other people entrust their children to me. So when I see things happening elsewhere, I have to warn people. The president of the Football Federation, Pierre Alain Mugengi, was a friend of his. He was a brother. I had esteem and respect for him. But he told me to my face that I had never come to his office and that I had never told him about the abuse. On vous accuse d'avoir gardé le silence. Le cas? Bien, euh, je, je crois que des In January 2022, a reporter confronted Mugengi about his alleged silence. Mugengi replies that the accusation is baseless, that the Federation had taken action but not publicized it. But in April 2022, he was arrested on charges of failing to report crimes of pedophilia. Parfait provided evidence to the police. So I believe that without Parfait, the arrest of Mungengi would probably not have happened. This is Loïc Alves. He's a lawyer at the International Footballers Union, FIFPRO, who helped collect victim abuse testimony. I believe that when it comes to Mr. Mungengi's responsibility, you can look at it in two ways. Either he's incompetent because he should know what's happening uh, in Gabonese football as president of the federation, or is guilty of having covered years of abuse for not acting after having received serious reports uh, of what was happening. After almost six months in prison, Mugengi has been provisionally released, but his case remains open. In a statement, he told us, whenever I have been made aware of allegations of sexual abuse within Gabonese football, I have referred the matter to the competent authorities. The Gabonese Football Federation falls under the global football governing body, FIFA. When a child discovers football, they also find mentors. FIFA has a child safeguarding policy. To ensure safeguarding children is everyone's responsibility, regardless of the country we are from or the role we hold in football. To ensure roles and responsibilities are defined within FIFA member associations. We are all guardians. We are the FIFA guardians. The guidelines say when child abuse allegations surface, taking no action is not an option. FIFA has not suspended Mugengi. They didn't do it when he was in prison and haven't done it since. And just three weeks after he was provisionally released, 
He was seen at the opening game of the FIFA World Cup in Qatar. Loic, the lawyer with the Footballers' Union, says it's not good enough. Which clearly demonstrates that he's not suspended and it created this problematic public perception, especially for victims. Every act of public support by any of the governing bodies is rendering the investigation even more complicated uh, because victims and whistleblowers are less likely to trust what they struggle to see as independent justice. They've done nothing. So even when Mungengi, when the president of the federation was arrested, they did not provisionally suspend him. He remained president of the federation while being detained. When we put these allegations to FIFA, they denied them and stressed that the FIFA investigation initiated by the FIFA Ethics Commission is still ongoing. They also said that all their investigations are handled in accordance with requirements made by the FIFA Code of Ethics, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, the European Court of Human Rights, and Swiss law. All parties condemned child abuse in any form in the strongest possible terms. Back in Libreville, at Parfait's training session, the older boys are playing a match. Parfait is pacing the sidelines, shouting at them. You're letting the ball stay too long in the air, he yells. You're giving the other player too much time to think. He points to a tall boy wearing a yellow shirt. He joined when he was four, he tells me. Now he's 13, the age most of the men we spoke to were first abused. At his academy, there are safeguarding measures in place. For example, a coach should never be alone with a child. The kid, whose parent is not here yet, we stay with him on the field, waiting for his father to come and pick him up. A coach is never alone with someone else's child. There's always someone else there. Those are the rules. To see them playing in my team and playing well, it makes me happy. Some boys have been with me from the start. I know they are safe, and that's a relief. If everyone could give them the same opportunity, that would be amazing. But Buffet says he has paid a price for speaking out. He's struggling to get funding for the academy. My life, I would say, was turned upside down as a result of speaking out. I took a hit. I was threatened. But when I went out on the road, I was also congratulated. There's always justice in the end. What I can do is to keep fighting. Maybe I'll not see the benefits myself, but maybe someday my kids will be able to say, yes, dad, you fought a good fight. Julien is grateful Parfait spoke out. If one day I'm face to face with him, I think I'd hug him and I'll say, Thank you a thousand times. He could have said to himself, I'll continue to run my little academy. I will stay out of it. Because he had nothing to gain, he had everything to lose. But he's the one who opened his mouth. I think he lost a lot by doing that. There's nothing but respect to be said for people like that. The criminal case against Capello is ongoing. He and the two other coaches face up to 30 years in jail if found guilty. But there's concern that nothing has changed to stop abuse from happening in the future. Capello was arrested, but I think there are a lot of Capellos in Gabon today. There are a lot of men doing the same thing as Capello, so if we do nothing, that's going to continue. This is Rémi Ebanega, a former player and head of the Gabonese Footballers' Union. 
This system of abuse has lasted so long and it's ongoing. And there's no framework in place to tackle it. So that means that these people can be doing it in plain sight and they are not going to be caught. And so it's become like this plague that's been normalized. There aren't mechanisms in place to eradicate this evil. But until this is done, footballers will have no faith. And the kids today who are 10, 11, 12 years old, I can tell you they are worried. It's true that we are fighting a battle today, raising awareness. But as long as it goes unpunished, it's not possible to win. The man who recorded that voice note, the one we heard at the start, ends his message with a plea. I beg you to share this message so we can put an end to this. These people deserve to be in jail, banished from football and society. Because if you do nothing, these people, they're animals. And they'll end up attacking again, no matter what. This is Assignment on the BBC World Service. It was presented by me, Hadija Tusise, and produced by Stephanie Stafford and Suzanne van Holmissen.